So um, I thought I would start by giving people an opportunity to ask any questions that they had about um, the homework assignments or anything else that um, we've done previously. So does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Uh, yes, uh, Steve, I had a, a question on uh, number one. Okay. Do you want um, me to share my screen and look at it, or do you want to share your screen and point at things, or uh, how would? I. Uh, you go ahead and just share it if you don't mind sharing your screen. Yeah. Does okay. that work? Yeah, sure. I'll go ahead and share my screen, and then I have. Um, let's see here. Okay, so this is the Gauss problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So do you have a specific question or do you, you just want to talk about it? So I, my, my, my question was, you, I, I took a, after, after sort of struggling with it for a while, I just took a look at the key. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand how printing sum sum is sort of defined in two different places so when you print sum how do you how does it know which one is it's referring to uh okay so you be, why is it here two times like this yeah uh, okay well, it said sum equals zero and then later it says sum equals sum plus number and so i was yeah. uncertain how it would do that. all right so let's let's talk about uh, what happens here so i actually did uh, i'm glad you asked this question because i actually did a tricky thing here so um, the normal way that you would sort of add things up or, or keep a running total would be like what I showed here. So what we've done is first set sum equal to zero. And then every time we loop through a different number, this is going to go one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. It'll take the number that we're currently on and add it to whatever sum is. So sum starts off being zero. In the first loop, it's going to add one to it. So sum will equal one. Then it'll add two to what it already is. So it'll say one plus two, that'll be three. Then it'll make uh, the, um, the number be three, and it'll say three plus what it already is, which is three, and so on. So it keep, every time it loops, it takes whatever the current number that it's iterating through is and adds it to the sum that it already has. Now this notation here basically does exactly the same thing. This is a shorthand notation that uh, if you wanna say sum is equal to itself plus whatever comes after, you use this plus equal thing. So basically this code here will do exactly the same thing as this code here. And then once you've finished the loop, and you're done with the indented code block, it'll go through just one time at the end and print what the sum is. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. Thanks for asking. Um, anything else anybody wants to talk about? All right, well, um, if you have any more questions, please feel free to ask. Um, I will go ahead and we can get started on today's lesson. So just a reminder, if you go to um, the lesson page for today from the lesson schedule, there's a link to the CoLab notebook. So if you click on that and then say open, your, open a copy of it, then you should get to something like this. So I've already done that and the code examples then are now ready to run. So we're kind of in an exciting place in the class in that we now know how to do a lot of fun things, uh, just enough fun things to be dangerous, maybe you could say it that way. And today we're gonna learn some powerful ways of storing and accessing information. So we're going to start off with a data structure called a dictionary, which is uh, sort of like the next step after lists, which we talked about last week. And then we're going to uh, wrap up the lesson today 
talking about JSON. JSON is like an extremely common format for passing data around on the internet and importing and outporting, uh, importing and exporting data from different sources. So we'll see how that's related to this idea of dictionaries and lists. So when we were looking at lists, we saw that they were a data structure that was sort of like a stack of variables. Um, so instead of just having a single place to stick numbers or strings, we have a whole stack of them. And in the case of a list, we referred to each of the variables by number, by an index number like 0, 1, 2, and 3. The difference between an, a, a list and a dictionary is that you reference each of the slots in the stack of variables by its name. So you essentially give a name to a cer certain slot and the term for that is the key. So you have a key, which is basically the name of the slot, and then the value is whatever you have put into the slot. So if you want to define a dictionary, um, you do it in a similar way. You, you do an assignment statement, but instead of using square brackets like we do for lists, you do curly brackets. And inside the curly bracket, there's a series of uh, of the items that you want to put into the dictionary separated by commas and each one of the items in that series is what we call a key value pair. So the keys are always strings so you can see they're uh, put into single quotes. The values may be strings like I've shown here but the values can be any other kind of data type. They could be uh, numbers, they could also be booleans. So um, in this particular case, the keys are the names of some cartoon characters, and then the values represent whatever company that character is associated with, or if you want to think, say, the company that it works for. So if we want to refer to the value in the first slot, we can say company, which is the name of the dictionary, and then we put in the key, which is Mickey Mouse, and saying company, square bracket Mickey Mouse will give us the value Disney. Um, so even though we define dictionaries using curly brackets, the notation that we use to refer to a particular item in a dictionary is still square brackets, except instead of putting an index number in the square bracket like we do for lists, we put the string for the key inside the square brackets, and that's how we refer to it. So um, you can use a variable in here instead of a literal string like I have here. So if you, um, you can refer to the keys um, by variables if you want. Okay, so um, <clears throat> in the example that we're gonna look at here in a minute, I wanna talk about um, a data structure that we haven't seen before, which is called try except. And try except is a way to error trap. So if there is a certain uh, bit of code that you think is possible that it uh, will cause an error, you can um, insert that code as an indented code block after a try statement. So essentially what you're saying to Python is try running this code in this indented code block. And then if there's an error, which is called an exception in Python, um, then do this indented error, uh, this indented code here. And when you're finished either successfully running the code in the first block or doing the backup code in the second block, then go ahead and do the code that's not indented anymore. So it's the same sort of structure that we've seen a bunch of times before where we have a colon basically saying, get ready, there's an indented code block. And then you have a code block that could be one or many lines long. Um, so that's a similar sort of pattern. So um, here's an example. One of the kinds of errors that we could get with a dictionary is if we ask for a key that doesn't exist, then the program will basically stop running and it'll say, sorry, there isn't any item with that key. So if you, if you want to um, recover from an error like this without the program stopping, then you can use try except. So in this case, if the character name that you're using as the key doesn't exist, instead of just 
giving an error message and stopping, it will print, I don't know who that character works for. So anytime you think there's a possibility that something will not work properly, it's good to put that code inside a try um, block, and then that gives you an opportunity to gracefully recover. So like a common example is if you're trying to open a file and maybe the file got deleted or it doesn't exist on the computer, then you can, um, you can try to open the file in a try code block. And then if it doesn't uh, work, then you can say, well, sorry, I can't find that file. Do you want to try a different file or something like that? Okay, so let's go ahead and look at a couple code examples. So <clears throat> here we have defined a code block that is um, like the one that, uh, that uh, was in the example. And we're giving the user the opportunity to type in a character's name, and then we'll look up that character's name as a key and say what company it works for. So if we try this, if I say, um, Donald Duck, it says this character works for Disney. If I say Fred the Duck, okay, this is the error. So basically my program crashed and stopped running, which is not a good thing. Uh, so if I want to gracefully handle that, I can change the code by adding a try except here. And so if the character that I type in doesn't work, it'll give me a message instead of crashing. So if I say, whoops. Uh, what did I do? Okay. okay, so instead of crashing, it gives me the error message and then continues on. All right, I'm going to try re-recording the section of the lesson where I got flustered and freaked out. So we'll see if I can do a better job explain, explaining this time. So on this, try this example, <clears throat> part A is to print the name and item, the catalog number of Z010. So there's a little bit of starter code here. All we need to do for part A is to simply print the item name and then put the key for item Z010. And if we put in a comma, we can also have it list the price at the same time. Let's see if it works. All right. So um, the second item is a, the second part B is a good trick. It says use a for a loop to iterate through the list of items. <clears throat> so here we can see the list of items. Um, a list is an iterable thing. So all we have to do is put in a for loop and say for item in item list. And then for each of those items, you want to print its name and price. Now we already have some code here where the item ID is hard coded. So all we really have to do is just replace the hard coded item ID with the variable that we're iterating through. So each time we move to a new list on the item list, it'll substitute that item ID number in for the key in these two dictionaries. Let's see if that works. 
All right, great. So in part C, we're going to extend this by looping through each item on the list and then checking that item to see if the name that the person types in is the same as the name of the particular item on the list. So let's build that out. The first thing that I need to do is to give the user an opportunity to type in the um, ID number. So let's say ID number equals, <clears throat> and then we'll use the input command. And here we can say what we want it to ask the user. We'll say enter the name after I forgot the inputting name, not ID name. Enter the name of the item you want. Okay, then the person will type in the name of the item they want, and that'll go into the variable name. So now, as I step through each item on the list, I want to check whether the name of that particular item is equal to what they typed in. So let's put in an if statement, if name, and remember we need to use the double equal sign because we intend it to be in equality comparison, not an assignment as we'd have with a single equal sign. So if the name they typed in is equal to item name, and here's where I made my mistake the last time. I put parentheses instead of square brackets and I couldn't see my mistake. So we want to check whether the particular item on the list that we are stepping through is the same as the name that they typed in. And if that's true, we want it to print. So we only want it to print in that case, so I need to create an indented code block. So let's see if that works. So I guess I'm only supposed to print the price. So let's delete this. All right, foo bars, which are item number X. 428 costs $250. Wow, they are very expensive. What happens if I say I want a thing in the jig? Okay, so the problem here is if I type in thing in the jig, that doesn't match with any of the items. So it loops through each of the items on the item list but none of the keys in the name list match up with what I typed in. So what would be great would be to have a way to say something to the user if there's no match. And we saw earlier on that we could do this trick of setting a flag called matched. And then we started off being equal to false, but if in a particular loop iteration, it ends up being a match, we can change the value of that from false to true. And then at the end, we can check, did it, uh, did it get changed to true or not? So <clears throat> first thing we need to do is set the flag, matched equals false. And then in the case where the name is a match, we can set, say matched equals true. After it's cycled through each item on the list, 
and we're ready to drop back out to the original indent level. Then we want to check if not matched. So if matched, in other words, is not true. In that case, we want to say uh, there was no match. All right, let's try it out. So if I ask for a thing in the Bob, they are only 49 cents. If I ask for a thingamajig, instead of doing nothing like it did before, it now says there was no match because it looked it looped through all of the items and none of them matched up. There, there's sort of two main ways that we use um, the keys in dictionaries. One is if the key is like an identifier for uh, a particular thing. So it's kind of like a, a lookup, which is the example that we had here. The other is to um, have the key represent some kind of characteristic of the thing. So like the name or the uh, zip code or whatever. And then uh, that also helps us look things up. So we'll see that in the next example here. So, um, okay. So here we have a more complicated structure, which is a list of dictionaries. So last time we saw that if we had like a list of lists, that, that uh, we can consider that to be like a table. And then the indices of the inner list and the outer list basically represented the rows and the columns. So a list of dictionaries is like a similar sort of structure, except that you can think of it as the, the row is identified by a number, so like row zero, one, and two, but the columns, instead of being identified by numbers, we can identify by name. So um, uh, here's the uh, example. So you, if you wanna talk about the, company value in the first, in row number one, you say one square bracket and then company. Um, so just recall that in a dictionary, the uh, keys are not in any particular order. So I've chose, chosen to display them as like name as the first column, company as the second column, but you could really mix the columns up in any order and it wouldn't matter because they're not, um, they're not ordered. Okay, and so because they're not ordered, we can't iterate through a dictionary, but we can represent each item on the list. So if we want to, um, if we want to like search for values in a, um, a list of dictionaries, then we can just basically step through each line and then look for the item that we want. So let's uh, take a look at an example. So here is um, uh, the example that I just had there or something similar. So for each of the cartoon characters, we have the name uh, as the key, the company is the key and the gender is the key. And so here's uh, the first dictionary and then the second dictionary is over here and so on. So if I want to know character number one, which would be Daisy Duck Company, it should say Disney. Character number zero, which is Mickey Mouse, it should give the name Mickey Mouse. And then character number four, which is Wally, I think, or no, let's see. I don't know, I lost count. Actually, character number four, well, we'll find out. Let's just run it. Yeah, it is Wally. So character number four is Wally, and Wally's gender is 
neutral, although I don't know, I have to go back and watch the movie again because I'm not sure whether that's really true or not. But um, <clears throat> Okay, so now we can do a trick. This is sort of what I was describing before. If we want to look up the information about a particular character, then all we have to do is um, to just step through each of the dictionaries and then look for the thing that we want. So in this example, we're having the person type in the character's name. Then we step through each of the dictionaries one at a time and check whether the uh, name of the character matches what the person typed in. And if it does, then we print out some information about that character. So let's try running that. Uh, All right, Daisy Duck works for Disney. Let's try running it again. Okay, so Fred the Duck was not one of the, dic there's no dictionary for Fred the Duck. So because this test that I did here was, was never true during any of the loops, it basically never did anything. So the third example shows a trick that we can use to um, handle the cases where it's not able to find a match. So the first, this part of the code is basically uh, similar. Um, <clears throat> we step through each of the characters and look for a match with a character name. But before we start stepping through, we create a flag. And I think we may have used this in a previous lesson. So we create a flag called found and that flag is a variable that's basically going to keep track of whether we found the character when we were looping through or not. So we started off being false um, and then each time we step through if the character is found then we change the value of the flag from false to true. But if we step through all of, if we loop through all of the characters on the list and we never find it then found is never going to get changed from false into true so when we're done, it will be false. And so down here, I have an if statement, if not found, in other words, if the value of found is false, then it'll say, I don't know that character. So I step through each one, print some info if I find it, and then print this if I don't find it. And then I have this um, little tricky thing here where I, do some if checks to see if the gender is male, it says he works. If the gender is female, it says she works. If, the, if it's anything else, it says they work. And so we put that string in the variable called answer. And then we take whatever, whichever one of those selections is correct and then add on four and then the name of the company. So let's try that. All right, Mickey Mouse, he works for Disney. Okay, let's try. Daisy Duck, she works for Disney. Wally, they work for Pixar. Okay, cool, let's try one more. Okay, so I typed in Mickey Mouse and it says, I don't know that character. Does anybody, can anybody figure out why it wasn't able to find Mickey Mouse? I think with it being case sensitive, because I, I didn't type Wally correctly either and it said it didn't know the character. Right, so there's actually a trick that we could do. In the section on strings, there's a function, I think it's called lower, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. So what I can do is change the name of the character into lowercase, and then also the name of what we typed in into lowercase, and do the comparison that way. Let's try that. Whoops, what did I do wrong? 
uh, oops, is it L case? I get my languages mixed up here. So this is trying to help me. No, that's not it. Anyway. Again, don't ever code on the fly when you're teaching something. <laughs> I know this is going to be wrong too. Uh, okay. No, it doesn't like that. All right. Well, somebody can go back and let's see. I don't remember even which lesson it was. String methods. Lower. Ah, okay. That's my mistake. So the mistake is it is not a function, it is a method. All right. So what I should have done instead of saying lower, I should have said dot lower. Uh, I think I've made this mistake every time I teach this lesson. <laughs> All right, dot lower. Okay. Some, uh, there's other languages where it's L case. I'm just uh, not remembering. Okay, character name lower. Let's try that. Hey, it worked. All right. Hooray. Okay, so that's a little trick if you want to remove case sensitivity. Now, I was going to do one other thing. So when we were talking about the homework before, we said there was a little trick if we want to do this thing where we say take whatever was there before and then add something onto it we can there's a shortcut to that which was plus equal so that means basically take whatever was in the answer in the answer variable before and then add this other stuff onto it let's try that all right that works Okay, so, who got that to work. All right, um, does anybody have any questions about what we did here? Did, how, how do you feel about this, um, the, this little flag trick that we're doing here? This is like a really useful trick. Does that make sense? I feel like it's helpful, but I'm gonna have to go back and watch and like piece by piece try mm -hmm play with it a little bit. Yeah. Well, this is a kind of a more complicated example because I've done I've done the flag thing and I've also done this extra um, if statement. So probably would have been better if I'd separated those out into two se separate examples. But anyway. Okay, so let's move on and uh, and go ahead and talk about JSON. So JSON is like really similar to what we've been talking about in Python with respect to dictionaries and um, lists. Uh, the terminology is a little bit different. So JSON has key value pairs, just like we um, uh, were seeing here. In JSON, however, it's required that the, that the keys and the string values have to be in double quotes. You can't use single quotes in JSON. Remember in Python, you can use either double or single quotes. And again, for numbers, you don't have to, you don't use any parentheses, uh, sorry, any quotation marks. So there's a basic structure called a JSON object, which looks a lot like the dictionary we just looked at. So it's a series of key value pairs separated by commas inside curly brackets. And then there's a thing called an array which is very much like what we were calling dictionaries in Python, where we have square brackets and then items separated by commas. So you can actually make more complicated structures by putting one kind of JSON structure inside another one. So for example, if my key is name, but I want the value to be uh, not just one name, but several possible names, I can have the val value be square brackets and then a list with all the possible names in it. Um, so
So we often use a structure of this sort if there's multiple options for a particular value. So if name doesn't just have one possibility, but actually several. One of the things about JSON is that white space is not important. So you can put spaces and uh, new lines any way you want uh, to try to make the data more uh, that you're representing clearer. So all three of these things here are me are exactly the same JSON structure. I've just chosen to, um, in this case, I'm putting each of the key value pairs on a separate line. And here I'm putting each of the list items on a separate line to make that even more apparent. So we can do that basically any way we want. In addition to taking lists and nesting them inside of objects, we can also take objects and list them and nest them inside of lists. So in this case, the outer data structure is a list with these square brackets. And then there's three items in that list. Each of those items is a, is a JSON, JSON object, which is a series of key value pairs. So in this particular case, um, we, we tend to do this if we, have, if we wanna have a list um, with various properties and values of each item on the list. So in this example, each one of the items in my list is a tweet, and then what I have is metadata about that tweet, when it was created, what the text of the tweet was, what language the tweet was, and so on. So this is another common way of using JSON. And then you can have even more complicated things where you have like an object inside another object. And so this is sort of similar to the uh, an example we saw earlier. So this is actually, um, if you go to the Twitter API and ask about my daughter, and her Twitter account, one of the items that you get back is user, but the value of user is a complicated thing. The value of user is itself a, a JSON object that has her ID number, screen name, and what her name is and where she lives. So this kind of nesting of an object inside of an object is what we use if the value is, is something that has to be described further. Okay, so you can basically take JSON objects like this and turn them into nested um, Python data structures using a, a, a function from the JSON module. So we have to import the JSON module and then one of the functions inside it is called load s, which stands for load from a string. So it turns a JSON string into a Python data object. So if the data object looks like this, which is the first example, then it's gonna turn it into a dictionary because that's the outermost um, uh, data structure. And then inside that dictionary, there'll be key value pairs, but one of the key value pairs is a list. So it's a list nested as one of the values of a dictionary item. So if we want to refer to like, let's say Steven, then we basically drill down starting with the outermost data structure, which is the, um, the dictionary. And so we put the key for that dictionary item, which is name, that gets us to this point here. And then there are three different values in the list that is the value for name. So if we want the second item on the list, that's gonna have index number one. So we say name, square bracket name number one. So that gets us to name and then item number one. If we have dictionaries inside of arrays like this, let's say we want to know the language of the second tweet. So the outermost data structure here is, um, is a square bracket, which means it's a list. So we refer to these as item number one, uh, sorry, item zero, item one, and item two. So we want item number one. And then the key for item number one is the language key, which is Spanish. So item number one, and then we want the language that tells us it's Spanish. 
Um, and then here is the third example where we had a uh, an object nested inside another object. That's going to get translated into a dictionary inside a dictionary, and uh, that uh, we can navigate through that structure by first on the outer level asking what is the user. That gets us to the second item in the dictionary here, the user item, and then the value that we want from the inner uh, dictionary is the location property and that value is going to be Hartford, Connecticut. So basically in all of these cases what we're doing is um, having outer structures and then inside them are other structures. We could have structures inside of that. So the path, if we want to describe where a particular piece of data is in the JSON, we put square brackets from the outer to the inner to the inner, however many, however many times we need to, to drill down into the innermost layer. And as we go into each um, of the layers, if it's a dictionary, we put the, the string for the key. And if it's a list, we put the index number of the position in the list. Um, but in any case, the path to the item that we want is a series of square brackets. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at that. Um, all right, now um, if you look at this, you'll, I didn't actually talk about this when I was showing you the example, but a couple lessons ago we talked about this, what are these triple single quotes? And we said a triple single quote is a way of defining a multi-line string. And when I first introduced it, it was as a trick if we wanted to comment something out. So if we wanted to comment some code out, we enclosed it in triple single quotes. And since we weren't assigning it to anything, Python just basically ignored it. But in this case, we are not just, we don't want Python to just ignore it. We want to take everything between the triple single quotes and then assign it using the assignment operator into this variable called JSON string. So this is basically a string of characters that has new lines and a bunch of other stuff in it. And then when we use the load s function, it's gonna turn that from JSON, a JSON object, which is, remember I said it has to have double quotes in it, and it'll turn it into a Python data structure called data. And then we can, uh, examine different bits of it. We can ask what's the name, what's item number one on the name, and what's the value for fingers. Oh, also notice that since I'm using the, the load s function is inside the JSON module, I have to do this import statement or it doesn't work. Okay, so the first thing I ask for, what is the value of name? The value of name is a, is a list. And so I get back a list. And then notice that, um, oh, sorry, the first thing I ask is for the entire data structure, okay, which I get here. Then when I ask for the name, I get a list. And, and as I mentioned, when you're defining JSON, you have to use double quotes, but when you're talking about a Python data structure, it gives it to you in single quotes. And so that's one way sort of that I can tell that it made that conversion. It's not just a string, it's actually a data structure that I can do things with. And then if I drill down on this list and I ask for item number one, then I get Steven. And then if I ask for the value of fingers, the value of fingers is 10. Okay, so here's the tweet example. So again, I'm using these uh, double triple quotes, uh, sorry, these triple single quotes um, to load the whole thing as a string and then I'm turning it from JSON into a, a Python data structure. So let's try this. So the first thing I ask for is what's the whole thing? And so I get this. Then I ask just about tweet number one, which would be this one here. So it just gives me 
tweet number one, which is a dictionary. And then within that dictionary, I want to know what is the value of language, which should just give me this right here. And sure enough, I see that Spanish. OK, and then here's the third example. This is where I have a JSON structure that has some key value pairs. But one of the keys refers to an, uh, a value that is itself a JSON object that has further information about the user. So first, I'm going to print the whole thing, then just the user part, and then the location within the user part. So let's try that. So here's the whole thing. And then if I just ask for the user part, which is this here, I get that. And then within the user part, if I want to know what the location value is, that would be just this bit right here. Then I get Hartford, Connecticut. So this gets a little bit complicated because you have all these layers inside of layers, but um, it's Definitely useful to get a to get a handle on JSON and how to use it because um, it's a uh, a very uh, um, commonly used way of transferring data from one place to another, and so being able to pull data out of JSON is a very useful thing. So with that. Um, I guess we are sort of running out of time here. But uh, again, I would encourage you um, this, uh, try this example um, <clears throat> and the examples are shown down below. Try to pull out the values that are referred to here from this uh, JSON structure and see if you can get it to work out.